Welcome everyone. Oh, can you turn on the back lights? What? Can you turn these lights on? <coughs> yeah, Oh, uh, yeah, brighter. I'm in. Yeah, okay. Since it's a small group, um, that's the internet folk. Some people are working, some people are away. Um, a bunch of people sent texts this morning saying they couldn't come. Um, interestingly enough, tonight's class was supposed to be last week, and we couldn't do the class last week because we were doing Lama Chupa for our friend David. Yeah. So it's interesting for me that we should be talking about death and the realms, and then have somebody who was sitting there just over a week ago, he's no longer sitting here. And I was really um, concerned about how to address that. I wanted to protect everybody, or I wanted to tiptoe around it. And I don't want to do that, really. You know, I don't want to, I want to face it head on, because there'll be a next person. Then mm -hmm. it could be me, it could be you, it could be him. So the point of these teachings the very point of all these teachings, the purpose for what we come here, we might have lots of nominal reasons to come here. I don't want this, no want that. But the ultimate, the big one, is actually going to be covered in this class, or supposed to be covered last Thursday. And I think it got covered more beautifully by doing the Lama Chupa. So I'm going to ask you, can you please, whatever bullshit habit you have about turning up to a class and this interesting information and then I'm going to continue being sucked into my old patterns please don't please make whatever efforts you have to and if it's doing a headstand or not talking to anybody or uh, asking more questions or whatever it is for you don't be the same you, there's a tiny opportunity to address the problems of this life and the only purpose of these classes for, for a reality more than what we can imagine, right, um, is to address those problems, really. I mean, it was interesting, we were talking about terminal diseases and people get diseases, you know, and then not here. So whatever that means to you, I know what it means to me. It means get my act together now. Don't wait. Whatever that act together now means for you, get your act together now, please. It's the biggest kindness you can do. It's the biggest kindness you can do to yourself and to everybody that you touch, everybody you see, everybody that watches you, everybody that's lost in the internet everybody. The biggest kindness you can do is understand these things and edge your way out of the vortex that we're all caught in because it finishes like that between from one class to another class. So with that, can I just ask you to take a, actually, let's do this and then we'll do a meditation. <coughs> Who wants to lead it? I want, I'm looking for an umse. Who would like to try it to be umse? Thank you. Sashi Puki Shishin Metal Tram Rirao Linchi Sri Dhamma Sukhi Cho 
of the Buddha's mind, your mind's emptiness, in the Dharma jewel, the idea that there is nothing that exists from its own side, therefore everything has infinite potential, it does not have to be experienced like we feel it's being experienced. And then we're supposed to take refuge in the Sangha, the community of beings who have realized that viscerally rather than understand it just intellectually. And there are the three things that can help you break free of that cycle. So with that in mind, take a seated posture, we'll do a short meditation. <clears throat> Once you've calmed your body down and placed it in a posture that you won't get distracted with and you won't move for the next few minutes. Give it a quick scan and release any tension that you are holding. Tucking your tummy just a little bit to stabilize your lower back. And with each inhale and exhale, just make sure that you settle your body and you begin to focus your mind on your breath, entering and exiting your nostrils. <coughs> and just abide in the sensation. distracted, just gently bring your back, mind back to the breath. <coughs> Don't struggle with it. Don't beat yourself up. That's just more excuse for busyness. Just calmly and plainly come back to the breath. still feel the inertia of today, whether it's your mind's habits, the thoughts of future or past, if you still feel that inertia, just again with the breath, each exhale, you're letting go of that, every inhale you're focusing deeper and deeper. Remember you can pick all those thoughts up in the next two hours from now or ten minutes from now. So see what it's like to have freedom from those for just a few minutes.
you know, you're getting deeper when you inhale and exhale or a little longer. So just feel that sensation, press your mind beautifully against that breath. your mind is on that breath, see if you can remove any identity that you put towards that breath, see if you can have a sensation of being more than what you are, the feeler of that breath, the perceiver of that breath, you don't have to be the limited being you think you are. In other words, see if you can experience that sensation as if you were something other, something more, something deeper than what you normally see a breath from. Another way to try that is to imagine what would the enlightened you, the one that's just about to get enlightened, if it were to have nostrils like these, how would they perceive the sensation of breath entering and exiting? How would they press their minds against it, that future you? free from suffering. And now with that you imagine perceiving the holiest being you could perceive right here in the room with you, invite them to come. Maybe they were always here and now you can see them in that way. Connect with that purity. find something or inspiring something that humbles you about them, something you revere, some quality of theirs. Feel it in your heart. And if you could spontaneously create some offering that would bring them this generator for them now and observe them, connect with it. How does it feel to offer something of beauty to another being? of deep significance. And the more you connect with that, the more that you feel any negative impulses in your consciousness are getting reduced there's less tendency for you to do negativity. And see if you can wish that upon others. And then rejoicing all and every goodness that you do, the efforts that you do to get free from suffering, to help another, to help many others. O 
overcome their challenges. Rejoice in your goodness. deepest understanding of emptiness, the nature of how things appear, how ultimately they exist. Look at your teacher in front of you and the image you're able to sustain of them as pure. Understanding that nature was created by your efforts. Ask them to always stay and always teach you in every guise available. And see if you can generate almost like a premonition of how they would help you in your normal challenges? How would they appear when you're struggling? How would they appear when you're close to wisdom, to a realization? It could be a sound, a shape, a memory, a feeling. Imagine it is them calling. Understand they function that way because they are empty. That through your deepest intentions to help your world, you create them in this mode. And because of that, they function that way. them to always stay and in particular to stay close to David if you knew him for David to find his own teacher in this way however specific or however vague but that it is certain that they should meet them there. Observe them rise up and face the same direction you're facing. Shrink and get brighter until they rest at the crown of your head. There are illuminating aspects of yourself that are ready to get enlightened. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I was going to do a meditation about what it feels like to be human. But what is it to feel to be human? I know we get the textbook definitions. You know, this is a human. I know it's got arms and legs, but if I chop an arm and another arm, am I still human? If I chop two legs, am I still human? You know, what is it that you label human? What is that bound? So we're going to look at that through the guys, through the view of um, an aria. Yeah. Uh, do you know what an aria is? Is it some opera aria? Like uh, an opera aria, yeah. <laughs> Somebody that sings the fifth element. The lady dressed in blue with an alien head and lots of pipes. Is that it? Is that what you mean? That's 
What's the difference between an aria and an aheart? Come on, we've been studying for years. An aheart has C and T. And an aria? This is in Nirvana. No, is it? I'm checking with you. You only have this one chance to learn this stuff. I, I decided to be badass today, if you can't the, tell. The heart is transcendent. No, it, it was right. That's what it, it was right, the first. Are you sure, though? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you finish Wait, today, are you sure? sure? Can you say and it again? Aria has seen it. Aria, oh, ah, and an aha. Okay. If you are not sure, you have to check it. So, so doesn't that, if they reach nirvana, does that mean it's an emptiness too? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Wait, was that the correct answer? I'm gonna. I let you decide. Mm -hmm. Means you have to be certain. I'm sorry. What, what if I say yes? Then I think certain? you're wrong. Okay. Good. <laughs> so you have to check, <laughs> right? Mm. So then I'll just be wrong. Okay. Then Arya has seen emptiness. Well, they've both seen emptiness. They've both seen emptiness. They, 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 both both seen emptiness. they have both seen emptiness. One has reached nirvana. Come on, you should know this. Otherwise, I'm not teaching the review class for <laughs> the <laughs> for desire and form comes. Is that what we're up yet? Yeah. Come on. Someone? You have internet. An aria is a noble one. The four aerial truths, right? The four noble truths. Right. Good. An aria is uh, right. what mm -hmm. characterizes an aria versus an ahar? Well, they're both superior. Superiors to what? Uh, an ordinary yeah. being. Okay, good. Nice. That's true. They have both seen emptiness. I'm happy to leave it till the break, too. I want you to be sure of that, you see? I don't want you to rely on me. Steve's going to look it up. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you see, there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with looking it up. You have to be sure. This is my point about this. Yeah, this is my point about this. The only thing you take is what you're sure. <laughs> you don't have internet. Uh -huh. So you bet. this is why in Tibetan monastic, yes circles you memorize this stuff you memorize this stuff you even if you don't know what it means you memorize it and then somebody tells you what it means and then it's inside you yes yeah like you can't get rid of something you've memorized because then you can attach meaning to that thing you remembered mm -hmm. what was that going aria anyway the arhat like one that is still coming in hang out with us is it? I mean, that's for sure. They can have emanations. Yeah, so... But the are you... Go on. I mean, this is Wikipedia. <laughs> What's Wikipedia saying? An aria is a stream answer, meaning they seen have seen emptiness directly. So but have not... Attained. They've well, only removed... It doesn't say it, but not, have okay. not. I haven't looked up our heart. Okay. Well, our so I have our heart. Actually, it Good. says, um, there's a perfected person who has attained nirvana. Excellent. Wait, that's... You were wrong, Steve. I know. Yeah. Our heart. <laughs> our heart. So you, you got it wrong the first time, right? You got it mixed up the first time. So, the so first you're an Arya, you're the stream enterer, and then you become What's the a stream enterer? What, what's a stream enterer? Wait, so the Arhara has already attained in life. And no, nirvana. nirvana. Yeah, nirvana. this is good. Because there's a difference between nirvana and, and enlightenment. Buddhahood, enlightenment. Right. Okay, the difference is Buddhism. Buddhism. <laughs> right. The difference is <laughs> omniscience. Right. Difference is what? Omniscience. You can see. Oh, so it's like right. Right. you're free from suffering, but you still don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And then when you're a Buddha. You free from suffering and you know. And you know everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Ar Aria for <coughs> Ariel <coughs> truth. You know what to take out the word to 
this. I'm more confused. I'm, yeah, I'm like, okay, let me, let me go through. The easy way to remember it, okay, is that we know there's a mistranslation to the four noble truths, the noble one, right? Originally, when these ideas came to the West, mm -hmm. Ariar got got Ariel truth got translated as noble. Now we use the Sanskrit root Arya. Arya is someone who has who's a stream entra, yeah, into them. It means you've entered the conveyor belt out of samsara. Stream entra means you've entered a stream. It's now automatic that you'll be exit so long as you do the things you have to do. So, but is the only qualification that you've seen emptiness? For an aria? Directly, yeah. yeah. So, so the, once you've seen emptiness directly, you're automatically on the conveyor belt. You're on the conveyor belt, but you still have to travel the conveyor belt. So you, seeing emptiness directly, becoming an aria is the third of the five paths. There's still two paths left after you've seen emptiness directly. The last, the second to last path is the path of habituation, right. which is the conveyor, conveyor belt. It is the stream. But don't you need a certain level of habituation in order to... Yeah, but they just call it that. It doesn't count yet. What do you they mean? they just call it that. You, you still need to habituate your mind to see emptiness That's correctly. That's what the fourth path is. But they just call it that. Habituation. I mean, they call it preparation. Okay. But then you habituate it more once you see Yeah, it. no, it's yeah. Right. But yeah. So you have the path of preparation, the path of accumulation, preparation, seeing, habituation, no more learning. No more learning? No more learning. Oh, no, no more. more learning. Which stitch of that? <laughs> <laughs> Not the lungs, the spider lungs gone long. I had, yeah, gone long is the last one I wrote. So you just habituate yourself to so. Idea. This was a real aside, but it let me make sure that we're talking about the right things. The idea is, you're a schmuck. You're stuck in samsara. You don't know what to take up. You don't know what to give up. You're just doing what everyone else is doing. Someone hurts you, you hurt them. Someone shouts at you, you shout at them. You're stuck. Yeah, you don't even know you have a condition. Yeah, and it's finished before you come to any kind of realization. You know this hurts, everything good comes, goes, etc. We'll talk about that today. Because we, we did freighter realms, hungry ghost realms, we did animal realms, we did the three the three realms, but, and we're about to do humans and devas or gods and asuras and so on. So we'll talk about the condition of that. Yeah? The Abhidharma Kosha, the book we're talking about, describes both the geography, the causation, etc. But we'll talk about the condition of being human. That's what I'd like to talk about today. Plus, that's all we know. The reason I said Arya is because Master Vasubandhu, who's the author of the Abhidharma Kosha, which is the English translation, Treasure House of Higher Knowledge. Good. So there's a treasure house, a whole house full of higher knowledge, right? Stuff that can really help the being stuck in samsara. Real stuff that can really help them. Yeah? Just a quick question. When Gesha Michael was teaching, is that the one that he said was a Volvo? Yeah. Yep. It was? A okay, I just want to like. Volvo. He said the RB Dharma Kosha was like a Volvo. Yeah, yeah, like a Volvo. Yeah, okay. yeah, great, great. Which is what we're studying. This whole course is coming from that school. Okay. Yeah, it works, it keeps working, but it's. Not the fanciest car. And since you brought that up, is that when he said the seven lives, that you have seven more lives to go, would that be once you become an Arya? That's on that's an average and it's it's here. It's on, on average. It's seven on lives. average. You actually have that realization when you have the visceral experience of seeing emptiness directly. So you actually say it's up to twenty one lives. It could be seven Between sometimes. Between seven to twenty one approximately, like and then you become an arhat. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't have to be between seven. It could be zero. Could be that's that same life. It could be the life after. I it's see. just unappropriate. Oh, I understand. Okay. Yeah. okay. So the reason I said Arya is because Master Vasubandhu, the guy that, the holy guy who collected <laughs> all of the Buddha's <laughs> teachings, put them in a treasure house called the Abhidharma Kosha, right? He was supposed to have seen emptiness directly. He was supposed to have had a direct experience of the ultimate nature of reality. He 
in that experience you have two cessations only out of the 84,000 mental afflictions you only kill two off at the point where you see emptiness directly and you become a stream enterer everything else gets habituated out of you through the path of habituation that's why it's called the path of habituation okay is that good so he was supposed to be this aria he was supposed to be this being who has had a direct experience of the ultimate nature of reality and then the reason the four noble truths are called that is because after you come out of that state which is in meditation the direct perception of emptiness over the next 24 hours or the remainder of the day you have these four you you have these 12 realizations grouped into four which are what we know as the four aerial truths you have a personal visceral experience of where suffering for you comes from. You see where your suffering comes from. You know it as a truth. Yeah, You see that it can stop because you were the creator of that through the way you grasp onto your mind and your world. So the first of the two aerial truths you realize as realizations throughout the day. Then you have the other two this freedom from that and you know the path and that's where you see how many lives you've got to live and you see your name and blah, the stories so the reason I bring that up is because we're studying death and the realms of existence the point of studying this beautiful subject which people think it's dry because it's Abhidharma it's a Volvo right it's like a brick aerodynamics of a brick right it's like <laughs> if, if the person that collected the works from the Buddha was an Arya, a being who had seen emptiness directly, then he had direct insight into the realms of existence. But he never wrote in here, hey guys, you should believe me because I saw hell realms and I saw hungry ghost realms. He quoted the Buddha only and he used logic in, to explain. Yeah? Explain uh, past and future lives to explain karma to explain etc to use logic and the Buddha as the ultimate source why would he do that if he had a direct experience if he's I mean I don't know if he had or not he's claimed to be an Arya help us to have the same experience how, how would that help us why couldn't he say listen guys I went down to the hell realms there's because all these dudes down there because we knew Buddha had this experience as a for us rather than just Why quite the Buddha and not tell us, hey, I did it, guys. I, I went around the corner and I saw these hell beings over there. He was trying to give the ultimate, what do you call it, when you respect, like the ultimate source. It's a nice mix, those two answers. Mm -hmm. Go on. Um, what would he give us that as the ultimate source and not his direct experience? Because we do that in the West, right? This is the, one of the things that we do. Here is like I've done these experiments and I've found I have these findings, everybody, and there's a truth in that. Mm -hmm. um, it's divorcing it from the notion of him as the perceiver, so it's like nice. Um, yeah, go on. It's taking his ego out of it. Great. It's, it's not just the ego. It's like well, what's the point of me saying to you, hey, I've I've had this experience. You should believe it. Well, it's off like. From a standpoint of getting people to believe you, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm not well, actually. No, no, that was so close. Yeah, 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 like, no, oh, that's right. like good for you, Hector. But but you I can't verify. Right, I can't Excellent. verify. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Or I could just think, if I didn't understand, if I'm in a place where I don't understand, which I don't, I don't fully understand. Otherwise, I would have had the realization. That was the Buddha, the only credible source. Yeah. Right. So if you're a Buddhist, if you're already in that mode, saying, okay, you've gone to this doctor. This doctor's worked out to be really good for you. He told you that the <laughs> hurt on the leg was caused because of this muscle, and then he did this to it, and it fixed the muscle, and then. The doctor said, oh, that hip of yours, when you sit that way, don't do that. And so you listen to the doctor. And you, every time you go to that doctor, they tell you a truth and a truth and a truth and a truth. If the Buddha was like that, and then he told you some fantastical thing about a hell realm or about the Deva realm, or we're about to get his explanation on the, the Deva realms or the um, God realms and human realms, then your, if your doctor said to you, listen, don't sit with your neck like that 
and he and you don't really understand why <laughs> but he told you all these other things that you were certain he was correct then verifiably that's your best source that doctor of yours he knows your body really well right so if you're a buddhist you see him as the doctor you see an enlightened being as the doctor He's giving you all these trustworthy answers, explanations, things that you can verify yourself and nothing you can unverify <clears throat> and things you can test and so on. So then here, he's giving you other stuff that you might not be able to verify, so you you take it on like the doctor gave you good advice. Does that make sense? If you're a Buddhist. If you're not a Buddhist, Master Basabandhu then goes into logic, saying, how about this logical proof and that logical proof and that logical so we've got two ways of proving. I'll cover that today for the for one of the things we'll discuss today. So I started off on the wrong foot. Like I haven't really started the class, but I wanted to wake up and say, you guys got to know what you take out of here. Don't come here passively, going, oh, that's nice. It's nice to have the nice feeling, but you've got to use it before it wears out. Everything wears out, even realizations. And when we talk about a human condition, it is one of the most disgusting things we have as a condition. Is this wearing out stuff? Yeah. So you the, the, that triangle there sort of gave the answer altogether. Yeah. It's not so much that it's not it's his ego, but it's like you can't verify my story. And using logic, if you buy my story, then by logic alone, you have to buy the next story, or the next story, just because I said, you know. Just because I'm wearing a, you know, I mean, in the 90s when Geshe Michael was teaching, everybody, there were brand new Tibetans coming, you know, and anybody that saw an Asian face, we were like, oh, holy Lama teacher, you know, and then Geshe like goes, oh, that guy is from one of our villages that near the monastery, and he's just a dude, he just put on, he just put on a robe, <laughs> and all of a sudden he's telling people stuff, and everyone's really ripe and ready to believe anything that comes out of this dude's mouth because. He looks Asian and he's wearing colors, you know? He's not like a depressed New Yorker. So, <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but you get the point, right? You get the point. If you, if Master Vasubandhu says, hey guys, you should believe me, I said this, it's, it's not valid proof under Buddhist logic, right? There's two, and in Buddhist debating, we learn there's only two ways to verify something. A, if you're a Buddhist, you've already assumed you're taken up the idea that there is such a thing as a Buddha and you consider them to be an enlightened being. And that means they have omniscience and so you you take on their knowledge in a certain way. So you take scripture or the Buddha's word as proof. We don't like that in the West. We use more the logic and the debating, right? Okay, let's review. The, the root text, do you remember? <coughs> Amidama Kosha, Master. Cool, what years? No, is that, can you see that up there? Yeah. yeah. Damn it. Okay, the commentary. <laughs> I tried to make it even lighter than last time. The commentary. It was like illuminating the path. Nice, and the illumination on the path to freedom. Freedom, nice. Lamp on the path to illumination on the path to freedom. By? His Holiness. The first part. Uh, Excellent. Do you remember his name? Oh wow. Are you cheating? <laughs> yeah. that, I don't mind, you see, because it's habituating. That's good. Let's see if you were right. Where are your notes? Right here. Yeah, cool. Okay. You did right. 1391 to 1474. Yeah, 1974. Okay. Uh, the three realms. So I, I think of these in terms of discs, right? It's not the way you should, but that's helped me, right? Three realms, coexisting. Desire, form, and formless. Do you remember which is which here? Do come, su come, su me come. It's in order. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Why? Um, because it sounds kind of dirty at the end. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought that that was the best one. So <laughs> She's using logic. I know, I love it. <laughs> That's all. Now everyone's going to remember it. 
Yeah, yeah. Everyone, no, and now everyone's gonna remember it. I no am way. Proud. Yeah. <laughs> proud is deep thank you, thank you. So if uh, I think of it as dukam, dukka, dukka suffering, suffering, right? Yeah. But I also look at these words and I go sukam and sukmekam. Sukme is mm-hmm. any me ma negative. is no. negative. Form so less. form formless. Form formless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Suk sukme. Form formless. Yeah. That's how I, I remember it. So good, you've got the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. I'll do this really quickly. Give me something you know about the desire realm. Right? Give me a... Oh, have we got it up there? Not yet. Give me a characteristic. What characterizes okay. beings in a desire realm? Food Driven and by desire, food, food. food and food. sex. Food and sex, yeah, good. Desire. So the, the main desire is for food and sex, but this, that we go for desirable objects, remember? So that's, it's a completely different way, a new way for us to view existence. And this is the magic behind this teachings, these teachings. It does take years to habituate your mind to look at this realm of existence through these lenses. But I believe through experience and through forcing my brain, that when you look at this world through this lens and you know what the western lens is telling you this world is we think we're humans we live on this planet we have this location we have this very specific view of reality yeah this is giving you another view of reality we can't handle that and in that problem lies infinity and you can really then begin to break down what you understand to be real because through this lens of looking at this condition, this world, this existence, this thing, you will come to new understandings. And let me tell you, we've been on the planet for millennia and we're still here, doing the same thing, getting old and dying. There's another way to look at this. Yeah, There's another view and that should ignite something in you to free you. And this is not the only system, but it's the one I've spent time on. It's the only one I can share. I've dabbled and touched others, and this insight and wisdom in others too. But in this view of existence, there's three realms. Yeah, there's, it's crazy. It's like when we, be, the planet didn't ever think that there were Martians really, that there were extraterrestrials. We thought we were the center of the universe. You know. And then when that became a thing, we made them very solid and there were Martians and then they were green and then they were robotic and then they came in all our movies, you know? And and all of a sudden, I, I don't know when it happened, it wasn't a stupid thing to think that we're not the only creatures on the you know, in the universe, yeah? It used to be that you were an idiot if you thought that there was anything other than humans in the universe, you know? So... It used to be when? in the center of the universe. We were at the center of the universe, yeah. You know, and then, well, let's move it, and the sun is at the center, and then, oh, you know, um, I nearly played you the Monty Python meaning of life song that describes our place in the universe today, and I thought that would be too silly. I want a serious class, but <laughs> if you ask me nicely, I'll sing it to you in the break. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about memorization. Um, the <laughs> So, food and sex <coughs> characterizes the beings that exist in this realm of existence called desire realm. Okay? Um, give me a quality. Remember, I gave you some quality for that. Something about the objects of this realm and the beings in this realm create. We are wrong perception. Good. Yeah. Good. We're developing attachment for something. Right. Because we desire stuff. Both the objects of our desire and the beings that we desire and co-desire with, we create non-virtues. Non-virtues, that's yeah. the word. That's a quality. Because we see that stuff ignorantly and we think that stuff's going to get me happy, I'll punch my way through it, push you out of the way to get it. And by, by that mere fact that I misunderstand where that comes from, I am willing to compromise a kindness to treat another being the way I would never want to be treated. And by that nature, it creates food and sex desires predominantly and all the other desires. 
by their nature force us to plant what are called non-virtues. Forget the Catholic, Christian, Jewish, Yahweh, God story that says they're punishing you because you're doing a non-virtue. There's no one punishing you. You are creating your own suffering. It's not that you were bad. It's that you did something that will hurt you. Do, do you see the difference? There's no need to feel guilty about it. It's an opportunity to say, I've got to fix it. If we live in a realm where the predominant impulse is to push someone out of the way to get or struggle with each other to get the job, the relationship, the look, the attention, the whatever. If we're forever willing to compromise second after millisecond and treat other beings in a way we would never want to be treated. The way we think of other people alone, and I'm, I'm a trained Buddha, 17 years. Daily, hourly, minutely, I have the most stupid, retarded thoughts about <laughs> beings that haven't done anything to me. They're just sitting next to me on the train, and I dislike them. Why? It's this impulse, this, this thing by the very nature of this whole realm of existence called the desire realm. Let's see if we got that right. Okay, oh, the, the divisions. Do you remember the divisions? There were 20 in all. The eight hell, hell, the eight hell, <laughs> the, the one preta. No, I'm reading from my notes. Okay, good. Notes are better than the, the board. Yeah. Yeah. One preta, one animal, and four human beings are conscious. Good, good. Four human beings in, in the different continents. Good. Yeah, one one pleasure. No, no, six, six pleasure six beings. Pleasure six beings. pleasure beings. Yeah. Sorry, I skipped that part. Thank you. We'll talk about them. Oh, there you go. Did you hear that? Um, it was a Christmas carol. <laughs> it was a Christmas carol. We should. That's a really good way to memorize. <laughs> I'm moving on. Let's talk about the form realm. <laughs> what characterizes the form realm? That was good. Isn't it like the mind? Oh, the form realm. It's not form. It's nice to see you, by the way. Physical matter reaches a peak. Uh, so that's one of the qualities, right? Yes, oh, it is. It's beyond the sense aggregates. That's. No. Well, that's the same. That's Wait, sorry, else. the form realm. Form realm. What's a characteristic of the form realm? Quality of being beyond desire. <clears throat> yeah, so it, they not they say, oh, it's beyond desire. Yeah, but that's, oh, okay, so it, we're beyond that irrational, grounded, animalistic, almost, food and sex. But uh, you said one of the characteristics is that physical, physical matter, matter reaches, reaches its highest peak. Mm -hmm. right. okay. That's why it's called the form realm, because the highest way that form as one of the five heaps which makes up a person when that reaches its highest peak beyond that you have the or less realm right so the most beautiful most uh, the highest most lovely form you could ever reach will only ever be in the form realm right but you're still willing to do non-virtuous more of mental or more subtle things that are not related to food and sex it still becomes a thing in that realm there's jealousy between the devas for right. position and there's other afflictions. Mm -hmm. So um, when you say like physical form reaches its highest peak, does that mean that they don't have to worry about food? No, because there are four levels mm -hmm. of the form realm and the fourth one is where it reaches its peak. There are other levels of less and less, more and more uh, subtle form until you get the most subtle form. So that they have sustenance. In fact, next week we're going to talk about food, but not as in food and sex that we're talking about here. We're talking about, remember I said, if you can look at this world through a different lens, That's the lens of the three realms, food is just one way of taking in sustenance that maintains you. Next class, I think it is. Next class, we'll cover what is food in all the realms of existence. What is food? What is nourishment? And why is this gross thing we call food? 
food for us? Why does it nourish us? So I guess my question is, they don't have to worry about sustaining their physicality. They have a physicality. They don't have to worry about uh, mm. keeping it there. It's just now it's it's more mental afflictions. So it, it, you could say that one of the quali- one of the one of the um, so don't forget this is all in samsara. Okay. Mm-hmm. So one of the things in in this deva realms is that you spend a long, long time in pleasure, no needing, not needing to do lots of beautiful things or putting on makeup and eating chunks of food. But at the end of that karma wearing out, if you have a bucket load of karma that is producing your reality as a pleasurable, beautiful being with form and everything and all the qualities of that being are all produced by karma ripening in your mental continuum. After all, the most intense, most beautiful, highest perfected physical and other karmas are wearing out, what do you have left in your pocket of karma? Suffering. Suffering. And so then, in a short time, that uh, we have this bell curve here where we, we are young and we grow and we're vital and whatever, and then we, as humans, drop down. And for them, it's like, some of them are like that, some of them are like that, and they stay high and high, and then it's like within seven days they're like out of existence and deteriorate quickly and et cetera, et cetera. So as far as like um, reaching enlightenment, mm-hmm. this realm is considered closer? Because the no. way that we've been talking about it, I feel like it's further. It is. This realm, the desire realm? The form realm. Yeah, the, the form realm is actually the seat from which you see emptiness directly. It is the first the first level of the form realm. If you can get, you remember the four levels of the form realm were thus called because they associated to specific causal meditations that created those results. So if you spend as human meditating in a specific way, habituating your mind to be a certain way, you would create your form realm experience because it's still your projection. There's four levels in that, according to the Abhidhamma Kosha. And at the first level of the form realm, you actually, if you can get your mind to the first level of the form realm, and you don't have to physically be there, it's your mind entering that from a human point of view. Oh, right, I remember this. You do? Well, I remember we were talking about like the different ways that you can enter it through <coughs> meditation. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you were talking about the dragon. Yeah. I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I'm never Can you add a dragon to your six angry gods? No, so, sorry. One <laughs> Sorry, one angry god. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm just doing review, so I want to go quickly, and what you don't know, please take a note, or what you've got a question mark, take a note, and just check it. You know, or check it in the break with me, whatever you like. Okay? Four levels, four more. But do you, do you understand that... Is that up there? There's somewhere there. Divisions for... Causal meditation. In, in other words, the, the yeah. desire realm, being human, mm-hmm. a specific kind of human in the desire realm, puts you in the best place for having that direct experience Sorry, to become you. a stream. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Great. So let's talk about formless realm and birth. We talked about birth in class two. Remember oh, the, right. the, the four. Birth, yeah. Okay. Let's th- let's go formless realm. Uh, what's the root text for that? We did a different text for that, but what was the root text? Trick question, Abhidhamma Kosha. Okay, what was the, um, the commentary for that, for class two? Trick question, the same thing. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk formless realm. What characterizes the formless realm? No physical. Only one. Great, so there's no. There's, there's one heap out of the five heaps missing from a person, right? Which is the heap of Mine. form. Yeah. Oh, missing. Oh, missing. Sorry. You're there where you happen to die. Okay, great. And we'll cover that today. Because today, I hope to, if I finish class four, which is human and Davis, which I think I will, after the break, I would like to do the barter because I think it's important. Yes. And I think it's it, it's what we would have covered today anyway. And then, then we'll talk about bardo realms and, and correct and incorrect teachings on bardos and what happens to the form in the bardo process. You know, if you anyway, 
Alright, okay. let's slow, let's do it. So let's do it. Done. I'm doing it. One hand passing. One hand passing. Good. Yeah. Which one was it? Physical the form. What are the other four? Sensation, perception, consciousness. Excellent. Sensation, perception, mental formations and consciousness, right? There's other ways to translate that. That's just an easy way for me to remember. Yeah, they call it other stuff, consciousness, mm. I can't remember the others. Yeah. Um, how many... Why is it a suffering realm? Why is it in samsara? Because it's so run out. Hmm? The karma is run out. Excellent. Karma runs out. Nice. What were you going to say? Not that. Not that. What were you going to say? That they're fixated. I know there's one where they're fixated on their mind or something like yeah, that. So yeah, so this is like what they have, this kind of mental jealousy. That's only you. Mind. It's yeah. only mind. It's only mind. Yeah. Characterized by continuum of the person. Excellent. Nice. So. The thing that keeps them locked in there, the, right. the desire to continue, is this identification as me, the being, the person. But the other ones, the other ones only mental affliction as well, but there is a point. They all have mental afflictions. Right, yeah, no, I know, but in the form realm, don't they only have mental afflictions as well because the form is, the physical form is perfected. So no, it's missing. In the form less. No, in the form realm, I'm saying the physical form is perfected, so there's only mental. Only on the fourth level is it perfected, not every level. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. You okay? Yeah, I'm just trying to memorize it. Okay, let's. Where is the location of a formless being? You remembered that. That was nice. Where is the where location of a formless being? Wherever you die. That's Here. There. But wherever where they, they are. Because there is no. Let's talk about the five types of birth, ways of being born. Not wait, sorry, uh, ways of being, not being born. Yes, yeah, so they say you can appear in any of these three realms in five dash six modes of being. Wait, what? You appear? Oh, right. You exist as a being in right. five dash six modes. We just learned it at the Wheel of Life. Spontaneously. No, that's a way of birth. I'm saying a way of being. Just give me the. Five types of ah, oh, the, the translation oh. from the Tibetan was five types of births. So you can be born as a oh, oh. no, as a human, animal, animal, animal. ghost, preta, ghost, craving spirit, oh. pleasure oh. being, semi pleasure being. Sometimes that's a five and six, right? Healthy and, and healthy. Yeah. So they're saying, is that there? Hell beings, craving spirits or praetors, animal, humans, uh, gods and demigods, pra uh, devas. devas and asuras, they're called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's on the wheel of life, you see a whole bunch of really lovely looking people throwing arrows at each other. <laughs> now, these are the four ways of being born. Do you remember? Born from a mother, mother and then womb. 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 Born from a mother. Warmth and moisture, egg, moisture, egg, egg <laughs> and complete. Prometheus. Yeah, Prometheus. You remember the images, right? Thank you for the review. Okay, here we go. Wow. This was last week's. This is an Wait, it. we're on class three? Last week was class three. Oh. No, oh, we, no but we that. are right now on class we three. We are now on class four. Oh. Yeah, we did Craving Spirits. We did, uh... We did, yeah, the yeah. Apiertos. Yeah. Remember you? Yes. Okay. Yes. No, I you don't. asked. You don't remember? I guess not. <coughs> you asked in the room. Where, where did you ask how they take sustenance? In the review, at the end, you asked the obstacles. There were three obstacles to pre to praetors. Yeah. And you asked what they were. Do you remember? That was your question last, not last week, week before last. How do they actually? Do you remember that there were three obstacles? We'll cover it now. Yeah. Anyway, that's what they're supposed to look like according to the Tanka paintings, right? Craving spirits and animals. We did the root text. This was really a different text. It's not a trick question. What's the root text? Havidamra Kosha. Correct. <laughs> What's the commentary? <laughs> no, what's the commentary? The commentary was different. 
It had something to do, for those of you paying attention, what's the greatest book ever written by... Uh, Lamrim huh? Chemro. Lamrim Chemro, <laughs> see, he knows that. Okay. It was a Temrim Chemro. Was Excellent, Temrim Chemro was... Oh, yeah. Do you remember this? Thank oh, you. I do, I do. I do. So it was it's like a, the, the first... Oh, shoot. It came before, I thought. It did come before? Run the steps. Yeah. Do you remember Geshe Drolumpa? Drolumpa. Lumpa, he wrote the Tenrim Chemo. Oh, yeah. The great book on the steps. Of the teachings. From, of the teachings, from which we get all the information about creating spirits. That's right? the one that the Lam Rim Chemo came from, right? Exactly. That's the one that seven years before uh, Holy Jason Kappa wrote the Lam Rim Chemo, he had recorded that he, he had uh, read this. Yeah? Wow. So it's based on this. It's all come back. It's all coming back. Let's talk about craving spirits. Uh, give me a general cause, general cause that would propel us into a state of being that we would categorize from this point of view as a craving spirit. Great. Bad deeds and general medium. cause. Thank you. Bad deeds of medium strength. So the ten non virtues at medium strength. What's medium strength? Okay. In general, it's not like premeditated. Four of mind, three of speech, three of thought. Yeah, so you have the ten non virtues, so ten really shitty things to do to each other. You didn't set out to do it. Right, or it could be anything. You didn't have the finishing karma, or it, it wasn't a complete path. Yeah, good. But you have the, you still have the perception that you did one of those. Yeah? You killed somebody. But it was so the first one is killing, stealing, etc., etc. It's not that they're bad from their own side. If everything is karma, based on emptiness, the infinite potential that anything could be, and you witness yourself extinguish a life, and you are the recorder and the producer of reality, and that energy of you of serving yourself through your actions, extinguishing somebody's life, that energy is in your mind growing and growing and growing unless you either short circuit it or it ripens. Once it ripens, it's gone unless it made you do more of the same, right? It's not technically correct if you remember ACI 5 because there's a little bit left over, but that's a sad story. So if you record yourself doing something, observe yourself taking an action, whether it's physical or mental or verbal, mm -hmm, you then have this energy, this potential inside of you to experience the world in that way, to see your life shorten, to see your life be squished, yeah? to put it simply. So doing any of these 10 misdeeds are like the group of the 10 shittiest thing you can do to other beings. Yeah, and they they're, they're in 10 for a reason. It's not because someone came down from a mountain and said, here are the 15, 10. Uh, do you remember that? Whatever that's from. <laughs> what was that from? That was some movie. Oh, the, the he came down with three tablets. Yeah, uh, here are the 15 movie. commandments, and then he dropped yeah, ones like uh, 15, yeah, yeah. 10 it's the world, commandments. It's the, world, the history of the world part, part, part two. Part one, one no, or two. No, isn't it part two because there's no part one? Oh, something like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, popular culture. Okay. So good. So the general cause for being general, yeah, yeah, for for experiencing yourself as a being in in the preta realm, or the hungry ghost realm, or the craving spirit realm, is any of the ten misdeeds in a usual. That the karma is there as a potential for you to experience that. The more of those karmas, the more of the potential. What are two specific, if not three? Give me three specific. Yeah. Failure to shelter to give the three types of giving, which was food and shelter. Yeah. So material stuff. Yeah. Protection. Protection from fear or hurt. Yeah. And dharma, realizations to people to wake up. And they don't have to be like, I'm teaching you dharma. It's dharma appropriate. Right? If you see somebody struggling with money, and you know a simple realization that they could have 
if you save, if you don't overspend. That's a dharma. That's a realization. You begin with that. You begin with what you can. That's a dharma. That's a, when they have an aha, it's a dharma. You can see it as a dharma. And that produces more dharma, more dharma, more dharma. Until you get the ultimate, the highest dharma, which is... What's dharma? What's dhar? The Sanskrit root of dharma. Dharma. Is it object? Dhar. Huh? Is it object? Some, it, dharma is an object, yeah. Thing, right? Thing. But it, <clears throat> more specifically than a thing, something that holds its own nature. Something that has a dhar. Yeah. Oh, right. That's right. It holds right. its own nature. When you find your dharma. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so give me another, give me two more. So that's a good failure to see yourself, perceive yourself giving any of these three types of giving. Failure to do that, not doing that. When you see the need, not doing it produces the karma for this kind of existence. Yeah? Two more. Stinginess, yeah, like being stingy with your stuff, keeping it, at not sharing it in a greedy way. Having the thought, Paul would really like my latte, and he loves lattes, and I'm keeping my latte. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's bad for him, and I, I can rationalize it any way I want. Okay, but um, if I know that. It would help him if it would be good for him. If any part of my motivation is for me to keep it for me, then that part of the motivation creates that part of karma. I could also have a whole bunch of other motivations, and that will produce that kind of karma. It's really quite surgically simple, mm -hmm. and we overcomplicate it. So that's like the greed thing. Thank yeah, you. it's stinginess. Yeah. And the other one, so greed, stinginess, that kind of attitude. The more of that you have, the more, the way I think of it, and the way. It, Holy Ken Rinpoche, Geshe Michael's teacher used to do it. He used to watch the lottery, yeah, mm -hmm. and he used to talk about. He used to laugh at the lottery. He'd like make everybody stop to watch the lottery, and he'd say, "That's what happens at death." He goes, "They go and just dig out that ball. It's like this is your near like you. This is your projecting karma, and it could have been that one of stinginess mm -hmm. that produced your experience of yourself as a complete being for a period of time." Yeah, because you have the projecting karma, the one that we think I am a person, I am a human, and that, like everything in these three realms, has a coming and a going, a starting and a finishing, a perceptual experience that things go through these cycles. They grow and then they dissipate, and it's finished. And that gives room for something to perceive the starting and growing and finishing. And the humanness does the same. We just have it for a long time, as long as we think we're human. Yeah? But then we begin to falter and go, oh, my arm isn't working, my shoulder starts working, and I begin to disintegrate that karma. And he said, holy okay, Kelly Pusha, it's like it's like that lottery. Whatever you've put in there, that could be the ball. So obviously if you're into odds, gambling, or anything like that. This is your opportunity to use that for good purpose. <laughs> Try and stack the odds so the lottery ball that's more likely to come up is the one that you want it to come up. You're, you're the only responsible being for having those impulses in you. <coughs> and you're the only one that can see them. You know, like you could all be sitting there going, Hector's such a nice person. I'm sitting there going, oh God, this is stupid. No. And then I get, I get that, and you get all the nice ones. I mean, it's, you, do you see? It makes no difference what we're doing with each other. The only thing I keep is my mental impulses, and that becomes my lottery. So to have the stinginess, the greed, habituated, and we all have it, that's part of one of the things in this desire realm. We struggle with each other to get the stuff. So we, if you're here, you've got it. If you're human, so the trick in in most Dharma books, in the in the Garjana's text, in Master what's his name? Bodhisattva's way of life, Master Shantideva, yeah, 
they give you like all the first 80% of the text, they give you all these Dharma tricks to try and resist those impulses or work against them or whatever. And they're all just like nominal. They're like, you can avoid getting hurt, or you can avoid being jealous, or you can try not to look at somebody. And, and then at the end, they always say, but really, you just have to get on your cushion, and you have to see emptiness directly. You have to get a true understanding of the nature of reality. Without that, you're not going to have the impulse to continue that effort. All these Dharma tricks on not getting angry, on being kind, they're just Dharma tricks. They are good Dharma tricks, because doing that nicely will produce the other one. Keeping that morality will produce the other one. But the only one that really works, they all say, I think you should have said once, stuck in my head, partly stuck in my head, that in Nagarjuna's text, it was page number 65 or something. Like he had the page where he went from, you can try this and you can try that and you can try that, but really. And I know that it's the same for uh, Master, Shanti Teva, yeah, in the guide to the Bodhisattva as well. Like we're still reviewing. You need the other. You need both. Yeah, you need enough Dharma tricks to stop us doing stupid things. So that you can see emptiness. So you can eventually build up enough accumulation <coughs> merit to be again entering the path of uh, second path. Preparation. Pre no. Preparation enough so you can begin Accumula accumulation. Yeah, accumulation. Yeah, I said it in reverse. Yeah. So what's, the, what's the third? The third? Yeah. Jealousy. Oh. So having jealousy as a predominant state of mind is another thing, another karma that could propel us into a state of... Ten non-virtues, medium strength. Is a general cause. Dangerous. Three specific causes are jealousy. not giving. Oh, failure to give. In any of those three ways. Oh, stinginess. Stinginess oh, jealousy. and jealousy. Why? Because of the karma confession that are left in your mind. But, but what's the quality of a praetor realm? They have three kinds of suffering. Outer, inner, and obstacles to eat and food and drink or something. Um, eat. That one. Um, they have in outer obstacles. The sufferings of praetor realms are outer, inner, and obstacles to food and drink, okay? And the outer obstacles are, if memory serves me correctly, you are experiencing yourself, you have a form, you have, um, you have like a subtle form, uh, a physical form, the picture is like the one I showed you. You see something desirable that you're going for, you're, you're needing something to satisfy your desire. You're never satisfied is one of the qualities. You're wanting some food or drink or you're wanting some object. That's where they see the oasis, but they can't. Excellent. And you see it in the distance. This is the outer obstacle, okay? And the closer you get to it, the more the oasis, the water, the beautiful thing in the distance turns into shit and muck and snot and all the most disgusting things you can, repulsion things you can imagine. So that's the outer obstacles. The stuff over there, the closer you get to it, the, the, so you can't find scraps of food or drink. The inner obstacles are that you have a very large belly, so you so that guy had a big belly and a tiny, tiny pencil thin mouth is one of the way that they describe it. So there's no amount of getting enough stuff in there to, that the metaphor is you can't get enough stuff in there to fill that up. And as soon, if you find something nice, as soon as it touches your... That's the third type of obstacle. As soon as it touches your thing, you're, there's fire and burning, Where's and it there? actually doesn't satisfy you, it actually burns you. What's, what's that one? That's the obstacles to food and drink. So okay. it like burns you when you get it? You have like, they have this fire in their, in their gut, etc. Or it'll turn into this shit. Into a sh in turn mouth. inside, yeah. And there are all these pictures of them with fire coming out and blah, blah, blah. I don't know these realms. I've not experienced these realms. But I don't... It took me a long time. I actually disliked learning about them. It took me a long time. And the only thing that helped me was understanding and studying 
emptiness, karma and emptiness, karma and emptiness, karma and emptiness. Because if you unlock that code, then it's understandable how anything is possible. And these are just modes. Like anything is possible within a human realm. You you don't have to be you don't have to be Spanish speaking. You don't have to be English speaking. You could speak another language. It's possible, but it requires the right causation. And then this, like I saw this Asian girl on the train on the way here, and she had the heaviest, heaviest American accent. And it reminded me there's so many Australian guys and girls that come from China or Japan. And if you were to hear them, they're Australian, blonde, blue eye, Aussie. Let's have a beer. Hey, gown. Let's get a pub. And then you turn around. And it's this face from Japan, or this face, from, and it doesn't fit in my mind. Yeah, and it, anything is possible within the human realm. We, we don't, we don't have to be the way, the mode that we decided or we were taught, or that we are forced to experience as is. So if that's true within this realm, just like once we thought the world was at the center of the universe, and then it was the sun, and then it was the galaxy, and so on, then it's possible to have a complete different experience of being if these karmas are the things producing our experience of being. Lastly, before the break, we'll do animals. And do you remember the general course for having an experienced rebirth as an animal? I think I put it up there already. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Not protecting one. General course. General course for Preta was? Uh, ten ten non-virtues and a medium okay. strength. Less, less extent, yeah. Accidental, uh, accidental, etc. Ten non virtues in a lesser extent, as a general course. And then there were two specific courses. They fall down to stupidity, but go on. Um, not holding morality. Mm -hmm. You mean more specific? Okay. Breaking a minor misdeed, is that right? On a regular basis. On a regular, is that what it's up there? You're yeah. Cheating? Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, breaking a minor rule on a regular basis. Yeah. So you've made a vow in your mind. You've made a, you've taken on a vow to try and generate a certain way of existing, and you watch yourself breaking those minor ones mm. because you don't think it's important. It actually boils down to stupidity. Yeah. Um, and uh, doing a great number of negative deeds on a regular basis. So lots and lots of the same kind of mind-numbing unawareness of your surroundings. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and the sufferings were just horrible. Where we think, remember I said that in Disney movies we think they're all happy little chirpy birdies <laughs> living happily on my finger. But actually they're scared shitless for their lives. Someone's going to eat them. They're always jittery because they're either food for someone else or they're about to get crushed or something. So animals are by their nature always protecting this thing that were, will bite, in, bite them and eat them or whatever. The great masses of animals were in the sea. There's 80,000 living on our oh, body. Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is all described in the Abhidharma Kosha 350 AD. Okay. They were captured, tortured, skinned, <sighs> eaten, enslaved. Like these are all sufferings thanks to humans mm -hmm. that like they said that this are this is a group of sufferings that are for animals that are close to humans yeah so now we're going to do this i'll do this as an intro and then we'll come back i'm going to do this is a, actually it's holy holy book called Dalam, the easy path or the path to bliss by what for a long time was thought to be the first Panchen Lama. And Panchen comes from Pandita. What's Pandita? Sage. Pan Sage, excellent. So Panchen, or uh, uh, ch Chemo, great, Lamrim Chemo, Pandita, great pandit, yeah, great sage. He was so, any lineage, like the lineage of the, uh, of the Panchen Lama, begins with a great being. Right, and this was a great being. In fact, this was the first being that was named Pension. Before that, this uh, this title, like Rinpoche, etc., wasn't given. And then, since that time, they've put on three previous pensions to him. Right, but he was the first person 
So if you look up Wikipedia, which I did for this class, they label him the fourth Pencham Lama. It's the same with Dalai Lama. Yeah. The first two. The, the first two weren't Dalai Lamas while they were there. Yeah. So the same with the Pencham Lama. And there's this beautiful. I remember when Geshe Michael was teaching this in the 90s. There's a tradition that the Pencham Lama, that the Dalai Lama finds the Pencham Lama, recognizes this, the reincarnation of the Pencham Lama. Yeah. There's a wonderful book yeah, that yeah. tells this yeah. entire history very, very nicely. The one in the 90s? Yeah. Yeah. Search for the Pension Lama. There's a Search. documentary on it. Yeah. Awesome. So I, I was around at that time, and Geshe Michael was teaching this subject, and here is communist China who doesn't believe in religion of past lives and religion is a poison or whatever. The Dalai Lama had found the Pension Lama and had named it in Tibet. He disappeared all of a sudden, and then the Chinese government was enthroning their own Pencham Lama, oh, the right. Communist Party. Do you remember that? Yeah. 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 And didn't they recently um, make reincarnation illegal? Huh? What? Oh, yes, yeah. I heard this about past that. summer, they made reincarnation made illegal. Reincarnation. Illegal. Okay, you can't do yeah. it anymore. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we go? <laughs> now you just break the rule. <laughs> we just constantly break the rule now. Great. Anyway, so uh, Lopsang Chuti Gyalsen, Lopsang um, was um, Jason Kappa's ordination name, so this connects the Pension Lama to Jason Kappa because he, he's recognized by the Dalai Lama's lineage. Um, wrote this magnificent text like a Lam Rim called De Lam, Path to Bliss. And then we're studying a commentary called the Chest of Jewels that talks about um, the specific sufferings of humans and uh, devas and suras, which are these two realms, the top half of the wheel of life, if you remember, right? So we have hungry ghosts, animal, hell, humans, gods and demi gods and demigods. Yeah, in the wheel of life that Geshe Michael just taught. So we're going to cover that when we come back. Give you, can we have a really quick break? Like go grab something and come back. Mm -hmm. Like it's okay to eat here. Because I'd like to finish close to on time, but I also like to share a whole bunch of really beautiful stuff. And your song. And my song, yeah. yeah. Yes. Remember? Yeah, I'll do that when we come back. <laughs> That's your sister. <laughs> yeah, I know. I do remember. Good. How are you? Good. Yeah, how are you? Uh, I'm good. Too. Oh, it's actually, an empanada. Empanada. Yeah, empanada. Yeah. yeah, I want to come. Bring when your is husband. Is there is there April 15th? After taxes. After taxes. Mister. Yeah. Can you get me the cable for? 
the sound. I'm ready when you guys are ready. That empanada was amazing. Thank you so much. This is Calamasa or this is the water? Calamasa, I bought earrings, earrings, the olive oil, and stuff. Really? The panel to wash. Irving and stuff. How are you? The oily hands. How do you do that? Yeah. Why do my hands on your shirt? Good. Right. Yeah, no, I wasn't on your shirt. <laughs> likewise, likewise. Yeah. Joe's going to try to show up, but I know he's coaching someone, so he, he may not make it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I saw him before. Oh, you saw him before? Yeah, oh, he was today? here, and then he went. Um, oh, okay, great. He had to take a call, so he went and coached, I think. Okay, yeah. so he, I, I don't know if he, he said he, if it's okay for him to stay here. Yeah, that's what, okay, good. Yeah, because that's what I was just passing on. He said he might come. Yeah, but I said, okay, okay, cool. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm not, I just, I don't kind of know. It's fine. Uh, is the review help or not? Yeah, it's helping a lot. I'm not doing much. 
Come to the work a lot of Thursday nights. So come to the monthly Buddhist review, uh, review 101 class. Because that is really yeah. helpful for everybody to hear other people's point of view. I'm trying to get you to in. That's fine. I'm using okay, my uh, thing. Oh. But can we get the others in? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, man. Thank So we might have to miss awesome. I don't think we've got time for the galaxy, so it will just be a frivolous thing. I'll cover it. Okay. It's not the way we think of it as born, it's up here. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a nice session. So. As a form realm being, for example, formless realm, uh, form realm being. So a bardo being in between stage, yeah. You appear complete. You don't have a bardo mummy and a bardo daddy. You have to have bardo sex and then you get bardo nappies. <laughs> I think yeah. I've had bardo sex. Yeah. <laughs> so in that realm, you experience yourself as a being, as a complete form. Yeah, and you have a specific shape, and and that's already as is. You perceive yourself as that shape. That's what one one reason. And then in the Deva realms, when you appear as a pleasure being in the higher pleasure realms, the, in the still in the form realm, you perceive yourself as having a specific kind of body, but it's already complete and in some cases clothed. Okay. That's the. So it's not it's not necessarily a physical. It's body. not in the human realm. It's no. not Except they said that Padma Sambhava would appear. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Are we ready? Yeah. Is Stephen coming? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm talking about the human and Deva realms. I asked myself this question. You know, if, if people engage with Buddhism, the Buddhists usually tell people, oh, life is suffering. You know, we go, hold on a minute, is life really suffering? So I'm, I'm going to say, is your life suffering? Because when I first met the Buddhists, I thought, you're all depressed or negative, and I don't want to listen. Yeah, it's like, I don't want to touch them. <laughs> is life really suffering? Is all life suffering? And I know we've been trained and thought and studied, but is your life suffering? Yes. It might not yeah. seem like it now, but at the moment... Right, but at, at the moment, it. like, I'm enjoying a whole bunch of things, right? But, like, at the moment we have to deal with it when we die, then it's really all going to suck. I mean, it doesn't matter how good it was today. Yeah, but you could argue, which was one of my gripes, was like, that's mm -hmm. fine. But now I'm having a great time. In the middle of sex, I'm having a great time. That's not suffering. When I, my nephew was born, it's his birthday today in Australia, he's 20. Oh. I was there when he popped into being. Yeah? It's the first time I saw that happen. Mm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that those That was things, a joy. That wasn't a suffering. I don't think that those things are suffering. It's just no matter how much joy we experience, the fact we're going to die and that's inevitable. And in a way, it doesn't make the individual moment suffering, but it makes life the proper noun, in a sense. Ah, uh, okay, that. nice, nice. Because remember the razor blade argument? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? 
even if it tastes really good, if it necessarily finishes with a cut, so if there's honey on a razor blade mm -hmm. and the first two milliseconds tastes amazing, it's a joy, if it always ends with a suffering, you can't call that whole experience anything other than suffering. Yeah? yeah the honey was still good. The honey was amazing, but every time you have honey, you cut yourself. It's not a s pleasure, it's a suffering. Yeah. I think it's also the fundamental sense of duality. Nice. Okay. Now we're going to get to more and more subtle understandings of this because I'm not going to cover the geography of the human realm as to the Abhidharma Kosha. It's like a whole fantastical thing and we don't have enough time. I'm going to cover just the six key true conditions that are suffering for a human and a deva being. Yeah, because we've covered animals, we covered praetors. Now we're doing, and we overviewed the form, formless, and desire realms, overviewed them. Now we're going to do um, human and devas, and the characteristic of suffering in that context is the six things I'm going to cover. It's one of the things I struggle. We run One Away Lives Project, we go to Nepal and we help the homeless and we help kids in orphanages and we have all these experiences. But the first few times I have this ignorant, I have this ignorant projection that somehow if I help this person not suffer with food and shelter and all this stuff, somehow I'm a good Buddhist, I'm a good boy and a good thing's gonna happen. And that's true to a certain extent. The true help the true way you can stop suffering is if you can address these things which by nature are there all the time. Because if you're hungry, it's there for a short time. You get food, it goes away. Then you get hungry again, then you give you food. That is a kind of suffering. But if you objectively look at your life every minute, there are some days you have a great day. Don't call that suffering. Mm -hmm. There's some days like you love your job. Like I just got my new job and I'm so excited. And that's really nice. That's not what is meant by this suffering. The thing to address in this realm is not that thing. You were hitting on it yeah. slightly. Yeah. We'll cover them in detail. And these are, if it's the first time you hear this list of six, pay deep and close attention. It's a horribly beautiful thing, you know. So. Uh, always with us, always with us, the six types of suffering, so humans as well as uh, daily realms. And the first one is that, so let's let's say the Tibetan, just to have the camera in our minds, uh, say Nepa Mepa, Nepa Mepa, and it sounds funny, right, nothing is fixed, but what it means really is that we are so disorientated in our experience that we need to somehow collect everything into these groups. Like, I hate my job. The fact is, if you analyze it, one minute you love it, the next minute you don't love it as much, the next minute you hate it, the next minute they give you pay rise, you love it again, right? And so, I think I'm fat. The, the one moment I thought I was deeply fat, and then I was less fat, and then I was... <laughs> yeah, do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, if you analyze your experience of being moment to moment, nothing is fixed. There is no grounding. Yet, yeah, nothing is fixed. In, a, in one way, um, the... Uh, Lopsan Chuki Gyalson said that this means that one moment you have somebody who's your friend and the next moment they're your enemy. It's not fixed. You can't get attached to this idea that that person over there is my friend. If you do, you're bound for suffering. Yet, change is constant. And everything, without exception, is that change for us in this, in this way of being. Mm -hmm. Does this rule, I'm assuming this rule applies to all of the realms. It's only human. It does, but this was specific suffering by Lop San Chuki Gyalsa. When he went to explain <laughs> the 5 6 realms, he was saying this is specific to humans and devas. Yeah? So 
it does apply, this applies to animals and so on. But the way you conceptualize it, you know the friend become enemy. Yeah, the relationship becomes something. So you love somebody, right? Who's had a failed relationship? Yay! Okay, well, <laughs> who, who thinks they'll never have a failed relationship again? You know? <laughs> ah, no, it's fine. No. <laughs> but it depends how you view it, right? Um, Okay, good, good. Thank you, thank you. Um, me too, me too. The nature, the nature of this realm is though, when you first met that now failed relationship, you could never conceive of them as the failed relationship. Mm -hmm. They were the love. They were the source of every goodness. Yeah. Uh, At that moment. Huh? No, <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing. The reason it's a suffering. It's not your fault. Yeah, it's not your fault. It is the nature of the desire realm that we do this struggling with each other that causes these non-virtues that necessarily means that karmas have this shelf life. And like I said before, they, they start up and they grow and they we have the experience and they flower and then they must necessarily end. To be born means you must die. To start something means in this realm you must end. And it doesn't mean end forever. You just do another cycle. You go through these waves of things coming and going, coming and going, coming. The circle, the core, what core, core, what core, core, what core. So that is always with us. There's nothing stable. There is no grounding. And who's your new favorite uh, historical Buddhist teacher now? Oh, um, Chogyam Trungpa. Yeah. So there's a beautiful quote from him that says the bad news is, what's the quote? Do you know it? You're falling. That, that you're falling. falling. You're constantly yeah. falling. Yeah. And what's the good news? There's no ground. There's no ground, right? <laughs> and there's a freedom to that. There's a beauty in that. Yeah. Now, if you want a ground, you're in trouble. No, you're falling and there's no parachute. I think that was the first right. one, right? There's, right. There's, yeah. You're falling and there's no parachute. That's a bad news. Good news is there's no ground this is reality if you if we had the mental capacity to deal with that reality it could not be suffering if you could just abide and be aware of this changing thing yeah, yeah? but then you pose the question so is the point of Buddhist practice or this kind of Eastern philosophy to put up with shit mm. oh well, you know I'm just gonna put up with it like there's a story of in the 90s when I learned this for the first time there was someone talking about a Thai monk who could sit in the snow or something for days and days a day at a time I remember Geshe Holy Geshe Michael goes I just don't want to sit in the snow like I, I'd rather not sit in the snow for like I, the job of this is not to endure pain like that's a Dharma trick to allow your mind not to get afflictions but it's not the point the point is to break free from pain the point is to break free from that thing which is producing a being having to sit in the snow for, you know, for, for days at a time. Sure, it's a good dharma trick to practice patience and all this other concentration, etc. But it's not the point to go through life and continuously having these uh, sufferings of change and the sufferings of suffering, etc., etc., and just endure it and go, I'm okay as my mother got cancer. I'm okay as my dad got lost and got run over by a truck. I'm okay, I'm a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. The point is not to have an experience like that. If everything comes from karma, if everything is a projection based upon the impulses, the karmic impulses of your mind, projected upon things that have no nature from their own side, emptiness, if everything is that, and therefore it functions. If it wasn't that, it couldn't function. And that's another debate. If everything is that, then figure out the true causes, the true causation that doesn't allow for these things change. Like this, nothing is fixed this way. So, that's one. Let's see. If I want to tell you everything I need to tell you about that one. Um, so... 
if what I just said was true, that our experience of reality is a projection of karma forced upon us by our previous impulses and actions upon emptiness, right? And we still experience it as a real, true happiness or suffering. They are my best lover. Oh my God, we broke up. They're the most terrible person. <laughs> he is my best friend. Oh my God, he had sex with my girlfriend and now I hate him with a passion. Yeah? <laughs> the, like, life changes like this for us all the time. If that's true, and we are caught in this realm of forever changing things, never fix, and having this shelf life where things dissipate and they start, and that just makes room for the next karma to come up, and the next one could be nice. I love my job, I love my job, I hate my job, I hate my job, I love my job. And if you do enough of that over and over and over, at some point you get renunciation and say, stop, stop. But you can't be doing the same thing that you were doing before to get a different result. You need something extraordinary, extraordinary, to move out of that realm of being caught in the willful. So imagine having the karma to perceive a holy text called Prajna Paramita, Perfection of Wisdom, where you understand the true nature of existence and that appearing in your world. Surely that's a virtue, right? Forget that it came from the Buddha or whatever. Just forget it. Imagine having, in your experience of reality, you see the cycles of suffering, things changing, etc., and then something appears called the perfection of wisdom, which unlocks the key to suffering and freedom from samsara. As a truth for you, call it whatever you call it, right? Surely that's a karma ripening if what I said before is true. And that kind of extraordinary karma ripening is the reason we have all these holy practices and all this bowing and all this weird Tibetan behavior. Because to recognize that there is a karmic event in your stream of consciousness which tells you you can truly be free from suffering, then that's worth doing every goodness for. That's worth doing any kind of activity that is holy and pure to keep that karma going because it is just another karma and it in this realm will have a shelf life. I will get senile and stupid if I don't act in my 10 years or 15 years of window of opportunity to use this precious, precious thing we call mind and consciousness to connect with this idea and make it something extraordinary that gets me out of that loop. So the first suffering is this. Can I ask you something about the karma? I was really on a rant. Yeah, you're going. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. No, like when you say that the like karmas have a shelf life, mm. like obviously they have to come to fruition. But like, does it have to be in this life, or can it be? Okay, course five. Yeah. There's three ways karma ripen. The first one is. This life. This life, the next one. Next life. Next life. The third way karma ripens. Any time after that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Buddhists. So yeah. you in any of your lives. You don't know? You don't know. You can so if you if you take if you use your mind to analyze, if that's true, the Buddha taught there's three ways karma ripen. Right. Right. One can occur in this very life, the other one you collecting karmas will happen in the next life. Most other Buddhist practices, by the way, are ensuring that the next life will have a good life. Okay, um, and then any time after that life, the karmas could ripen. You don't know because they depend on the intensity of the karma, the intensity of the object, and all these other things to make it what's called a karma marga. But I'll give you something that's precious about what we just discussed: the fact that the Buddha said you can have karmas ripen in this one lifetime is the basis for the secret teachings, is the basis for Tantra, which is not something you're supposed to talk right. about openly or publicly as a practice and a detail. And if you know just the right karmas to plant and how to plant them with full understanding of the ultimate nature of things, then you can ensure that you will, in this precious human life, have a ripening of the karmas yeah. you planted. And you, being a young human, not old and shaggy like me, have much more opportunity because your mind is supple and your mind and 
your energies around that. The older, the more stupid I get. Okay, mm. that's the nature of this realm. The neuron pathways are habituated in a certain way, and the older I get, the harder it is for me to unplug from that. Unless you do a little <laughs> trick called hypnosis. Train hypnosis, self hypnosis, where you train yourself to take change as a pleasurable thing. And that's a, mm -hmm. a story, okay? Where you train yourself to be untrained all the time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's a story. You're welcome. I feel like the more I come here, the younger I get. Nice. Yes. And I'm sucking your age and I'm getting older. Look at this. No, I'm 25. Younger, yeah. younger, like, <laughs> younger like you. This is a sick, sick thing. I'm going to go over by at least 15 minutes, but this is worth it. So I'm going to say stay if you want it. We're yeah? just getting younger. Okay, we're just getting younger. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what is it? I'm the, um, the succubus then? Is that what it is? The, is yeah. it succubus? Is, what's no. the succubus? Yeah, that's that's yeah, like a like demon or something that sucks the life out of everyone yeah. else. <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing, I'm like taking on your life, I'm getting older. And I'm just 25. Um, so, non mi shepa, say, uh, non mi shepa. This is, this is disgusting. And the Pinchant Lama says, check this out. This is the pursuit of happiness, right? The, he describes it in this way. He says, the pursuit of happiness is we see a desirable object out there. We see something that we think is going to make us happy, right? Unfortunately, it's Starbucks, I believe, they won't. But there's good coffee out there that will make me really happy. And by the nature of the kind of beings we are, <coughs> we all have, and it does include animals, etc. We have this thing where we approach that object, and then we have this kind of taking it into ourselves mm -hmm. we consume it mm -hmm. we become it we um how did he say he said you bring it into yourself to try and you digest it yeah you digest the object whether it's a mental object an emotional object a, a being. we digest all this stuff we're forever consuming this thing because this is the pursuit of happiness if we get it we'll be happy right yeah and he says it's a paradox. He goes, it actually does the reverse. Because as soon as we've consumed it, we've become it, we've taken it. And we've done bad shit mostly to do it, right? Mm -hmm. We either, I want to get my promotion over her so I can get my mortgage paid. Or I want, you know, if I could just get ahead of the line. Or if I can get more fame and fortune. <coughs> or if I'm a little bit more in the spotlight. It's usually, if I get that thing, I'm going to be happy. And we're willing to compromise. I don't want to use the word morality, but it is a morality. It is a way of treating. If everyone else was also you, and and they were treating you like you're treating them, you would hate it. Yeah, if if you were the one pushed by yourself, <laughs> by your other self, mm -hmm. to get the promotion, to get the money, to get the object, yeah. So we're willing to compromise that relating to others in order to get that thing which should, by its nature, it's the pursuit of happiness, it should give us this happiness. But as soon as, as, soon as we've consumed it, instead of satisfying, we get this next feeling that the satisfaction lasts only for a moment and instantly almost you want it bigger, better, stronger, longer, lesser, something other than what you've got. It should at least give you pleasure for a while. It should, the kind of stuff we're willing to do to get the stuff that we think is going to make us happy, should at least make us happy for a while. And it works to do the opposite. And that is with us all the time. That is the, the, the karma class says 65 instances of movement of the mind every finger snap. So every millisecond, this many karmas are being used up and planted. Yeah? So we're willing to do all sorts of mental conniving and physical conniving to get this thing that once we consume, we'll be happy and instantly we want more, different, more. <laughs> what if um, you're not doing the bad things, but you're still pursuing the good things? 
So that still falls under this rule, right? Like, so the, say I ha I was making a ton of money and I went out yeah, shopping yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this still follows this description right. of this basic suffering is you're never satisfied. Because why are you wearing the clothes you bought five years ago? Why? Why, <laughs> why aren't we satisfied with the relationship we had two years ago? Still, why aren't you happy? Hmm? You're still pursuing the thing that you, the object yeah. that you think is going to make you happy, but then when you get it, you're still wanting yeah. more of it. So, so Lobsan Chuki Gelson says that thing cannot be called the pursuit of happiness. Right. In fact, it's a mistake. It's actually the pursuit of more suffering. Yeah, for me, this this awareness, which has been happening, the more I meditate, the more I hear these teachings, that just connecting the dots in general, harshes the buzz that on the fact that anything outside of me can make me happy. Mm. Exactly, exactly at the bottom. Anything, the bottom. anything. It's yeah. all inside. Yeah. Nice, 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 nicely said. But the the mistake is, from the majority of the creatures crawling on this planet, that's what it is. We go for it, right? Sure. And it will make us happy. Stardom, this yeah. or that or the other. Yeah. And we've all passed that, hopefully. We hopefully. Have, yeah. Let's go through. There's two things here. One is shedding your body over and over, and the other one's being born over and over. Um, this is this, and and this one is like you know, so being shedding your body over and over I mean so what I don't remember you know <laughs> so it's like a big deal so that's not a suffering that's with me all the time but the way that Lobsan Chuki Gyalsan explained it and I'm so glad Geshe Michael brought something more than the Abhidharma Kosha to explain this is that being in this state of being I am this human I am this human not that human yeah I am this body we think predominantly I'm um, this and not that. Why? Because I feel this and I don't feel that somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shedding the body over and over refers to, the Lobsan Chuki Gyalsan said, the idea that we have a prejudice for this body over other beings' body. Yeah? yeah? That the if you balance yourself versus the seven billion other humans and you know it's satisfying to take a drink, you prejudice this body over and above the other. Selfishness. This kind of selfishness. Yeah? That's amazing. That to to misunder misapprehend right. that there is a separation. Yeah? Right. Because we have a perception of a separation, we think it's a real separation, then we do misdeeds. We we the suffering comes from doing things to protect this body, yeah? And then the body, connected to the next thing, being born over and over, that we protect over other beings. We wash over other beings, we sleep, we clothe over other beings. Is the thing you leave, that like you can't take it. <laughs> like it's shed, it's dumped. Oh, at the end, and the only thing you've got are those impulses that create your next experience. And those impulses are covered and filled with me over you, which forces your next experience of being reborn over and over as me separate to you. <coughs> do, do you see that? I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful explanation yeah. from yeah. Lobsan Chuki Gyalsan. And the fact that we had that misconception and all the behaviors that are associated to that is what causes the human and ever suffering realms. That, that idea behind these sufferings is that there, that like, there's nothing that actually separates you from someone from another being. On a nominal way, there is, right? Like, right. I can't right. think your thoughts. You can't think my thoughts. Right. But, but he's separating body. mind versus body. Yeah. He's like, forget the mind for a second. He's like, here is this body. It needs nourishing, and there's that body, and that needs nourishing. I have a prejudice for this thing, because I think it's it's me. Yeah, this me, mind, ego thing. So he's saying that causes us to do specific karma, specific actions, which then have a result equal and opposite to the intent. Mm -hmm. So is it that on a deeper level, we're all we're completely connected? At, at the ultimate level, the, um, what's the answer? At the ultimate level? 
See, there's no separation. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, no but that, but see, oh, this is no something I thought about earlier today on my way to go teach. You know, mm -hmm. I found myself irritated judging somebody, as you were speaking about, and I knew that it was because I was feeling disconnected, mm -hmm. because I was not feeling seen, because I was not feeling loved, for whatever reason, you know, and, and that's a habituation that we all have in this realm, and it's because we think that this is me, mm -hmm. right, but when we can connect more and more, and usually I find, like, if somebody's really suffering, I tell them, go do service, um, but it's that moment where you feel disconnected that you then project that onto somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's just a cycle again, 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 again. That's nice. I, I think to answer your question in a, in a deeper level, perceptually, Holy Gish Michael says this thing about bodhicitta, right? Functionally, this mouth getting a drink I can feel it, I can sense it, it's my mouth. Right? So I better keep feeding it because I like it, I enjoy it. I've got no um, no feeling or sensation of me feeding your mouth or that mouth or that mouth. That mouth isn't my mouth, right? This is my mouth. That's how it appears to us, truly. Perceptually, though, once you understand that the only way, if you understand the ultimate nature, that things are empty and therefore everything that occurs to you is a karma ripening, based upon you having done something like that similar to others in the past. The only way I could ever, ever experience this as a pleasure or sustenance is that I must have given it to others in the past. So the only way I could ever get food is if I ensure that food goes in those mouths. They are my mouths in the ultimate sense, even though I can't feel them. But I think it sometimes you can though. Or I've yeah, experienced that. I think that. so too. That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, you can. And yeah. part of it's neural attunement. You should look it's up Dr. Neural, neural attunement. Yeah. Look okay. up Dr. Dan Siegel. But cool. it's... I would... Well, I'll tell you what. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. For most people, it's from a physical standpoint, you can't. But that is the same thing as the karmic lag. Like, just because... But we're forced to experience things in this time, this linear sense of time, because mm -hmm. it's the same. So, because our karma has to grow, it has to. It has to, right? Like, otherwise, this wouldn't function. So, their mouth experiencing pleasure, if there weren't time and it was just mouth experiencing pleasure, it could literally be us tasting it. It's just that we only taste it an hour Lots. later or a year later. So, we taste Or the two lives later. Right, or whatever, mm -hmm. we think that it's their mouth tasting it, excuse mm -hmm. me, it's their mouth and not our mouth, but when we taste it a year later, it actually is our mouth tasting Beautiful. it. Beautiful. So, right. in, in function, it is my mouth. It's the same, it's just that we don't understand it because it's Oh, beautiful. That was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, let me finish these six, and then I thought I was going to mm -hmm. do Bardo wrong, but I won't. I'll do that next week. Sorry. Mm -hmm. The being born over and over again refers also to the <coughs> fact that the same energy that propelled us into being is the same energy that will propel us into dying. Mm -hmm. That the same energy that be began is the mm -hmm. same energy that ends. They're connected in this in this experience of karma as we know it. Mm -hmm. The the same energy that propelled us to be young and vital is exactly the same energy that will result me in being old and frail. And and dead, mm -hmm. or youthful and beautiful and old and ugly. And it's funny because when that comes to us, we get these anxiety attacks, right? We get this, oh, I'm getting old, or for those of you who have your hair falling out, or, or whatever that is. And it's sort of the right response. <laughs> but you should freak out. It's terrible. <laughs> this, this suffering of change is terrible. But we do the wrong thing to try and fix it. You know, we go and get makeup, or we go and get liposuction, or we go and fight with someone else, or we we ignorantly go and attack a different mode of causation to stop that feeling of it's all breaking down, rather than addressing the core 
the core reason why ignorance, why things are breaking down. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, for me, it's. I mean, I don't want to say I have days where I'm like, oh shit, I hate getting older. But I also, the more I practice, I'm getting to a place where I'm feeling, yeah, that, that energy that makes me alive is the energy that's also going to take off and it's going to fly, and his body's going to fall away because that's what's meant to happen. Yeah. It, it's nice to hear that because you're a practitioner. But I'm thinking that the description of this is for the 7 billion creatures who are digging the earth to find gold and right. earth and yeah. dirt and <laughs> have to feed the children. And like we're so lucky, right? We're like sitting yeah. around in this a New York lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, you know, like, let's consider what suffering is all about. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. and, and, <laughs> and it's, it's easy. And, and, it's, and that's why it's precious. Because yeah. we have so... How many beings that you know of that you're talking like? Sorry to take up longer time. I actually don't care. I'm happy to take longer time for this Go class. So I hope you can stay a little. Go for it. Um, we're going to Nepal soon to go and help all these, all these people. And you forget <laughs> how fortunate we really, really are, mm -hmm. and how different we are to the rest of the world. We're having this kind of luxury life in New York. And it finishes like that, like that, it finishes mm -hmm. like that. You know, and you don't know when, and this is, so the whole course is leading up to, the only reason we're talking about the realms of existence is because it's leading up to a death meditation, mm -hmm. which is the, the end of the course, right? And really getting a good, strong death meditation, not that it should weaken you or freak you out, or the anxiety we feel about experiencing the changes of life or the sufferings of life shouldn't debilitate us, they should empower us to say, this that we have here, the capacity to understand, cognize, and make efforts in a deeper way that's closer to true causality rather than the thing that will produce more of the cycling, is only a thing we have for a short time. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to hear it, but part of me is going, that's more reason why we should keep, keep at it, because we also have the mistake of, oh, I'm relaxed, I'm chill, I'll turn up to the three, two, you know? Yeah. Um, Thanks. No problem. The next one is, after high comes low, this young, young, uh, Tome, young, young, Tome, Tome, whatever. <laughs> and that's just the nature of karma, of the seeds, right? That like, things come and things go. You get really excited on something and you have all this energy and then something happens to us and then it's like it's not as exciting anymore, it's not as good. And then the next once that karma finishes, the next karma comes. And once that finishes, the next karma comes. And it's no different about uh, I've seen it for so long with Dharma teachings. I wish we could call it other things than Buddhist Dharma or Dharma teachings. If I could tell you you are listening, hopefully, you are listening if you're Karmas are appearing the way that they were when I first met this stuff. You are listening to a map, a code that says you have the power to transform your very existence to something completely blissful. Yes, enlightenment is possible. Yes, nirvana is possible. Yes, it's not possible without hard work. But it is possible. And you have the key, and you have a lineage, and you have the tools and all you need to do is do it. And it's not like you have to do all of it. It's like there is a code and you can pick for this type of personality or that type of personality or this, but it requires some basic things. And until you become a stream enterer, it's just a lottery. Yes, it's good I'm having nice, lovely realizations. The window of opportunity for this life is this. To meet this experience again, Imagine the karma being burnt up. If everything is karma ripening, the karma, the virtuous karma, the goodness being burnt up, to hear the words, you can create your own universe. Your whole construct of being can be recreated. That in itself is the most intense, amazing virtue burning off. Yeah? And unless you know how to replant it, that's why we do the dedication at the end. Hopefully that's what we're doing, yeah, unless you know how to replant that seed so your your weeds get infested with this forest for enlightenment, 
then we're just burning good karma. Yeah? So to, mm -hmm. I'm ranting again. No, no, so after okay. high comes low, the point I said that about Dharma is I've been around this stuff long enough that I've been here and surely you've done it too, <coughs> where you've heard this teaching once or you've heard this idea twice. And just the thought of the idea is enough to say, oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. You never practiced it. You never went into depth. You never challenged yourself enough to really see it. You're like, oh, I heard it. And then you come three months later, six months later, and you hear it again. And you're like, I liked it better the first time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess you might have thought it differently. And then you become this critic <laughs> of Dharma. It's not for that, yeah? But this is the same thing. This energy, we, we have this connection to high and low. The karma's changing. You hear Dharma, you hear realizations, you hear truths, you hear insights, things that spark a meaning in you. And then it's like, that wears out. And then it's like, oh, it's normal. This is our suffering. This is with us all the time. And it's not just about this. It's unfortunate that it's with this too. Yeah, there, there is wisdom in the world. And when we see it, we go, ah, after a while, because we have this thing. The last one is, the last suffering is there's no companion, meaning you can't take you, we can't take any of the things you've worked your ass off in this realm to do, the house, the car, etc. And even in your mind, as much as we'd like to think we're connected, etc., etc., our streams of mind are separate. We can have the perception of union. We can understand how functionally we operate with each other. But really, what you construct in your mind through your actions of thought and speech and action, they are the only things you take after the body goes. Whatever energies you've had, whatever habits you've formed, whatever realizations you've entered into, and however you've habituated that, there is no taking any of the donut you push the old lady for, the car, the promotion, the job. They're functionally good for you. You need them. But you don't need to hurt anybody for them. Because the hurt, the perception of hurting, the, per the perception of getting, struggling with other beings is the only impulses you take which create your next experience of being. So I was digressing, right? The purpose of this course is to describe the whole Abhidharma Kosha chapter 3 describing the realms of existence as a destination point for possible states of being after death. The death meditation is the core of the class. But before you go into death meditation, understand that there's all these modes of being because. And we understood karma, we understand past and future lives from all the courses before. Now comes, what's a, what's a mode of being and what causes then from this view, this angle of existence? So it doesn't matter that they are your holy teacher, your special friend, your best buddy, if they're asking you or you're feeling compromised to do something to, to do for your holy teacher, if they're asking you something that breaks your virtue, you have to say no. Mm. You have to say no. Because they don't take your karma. <laughs> they don't take your mental impulses. And this is the good news and the bad news about this practice. You are in charge of your life. That's the good news and that's the bad news. You are completely and utterly in charge of your reality. And everything that happens to you is you. And everything that happens to you is you. And everyone you meet is you. And everything you do is you. And you can because things are changing. They don't hold a nature. They don't dart from their own side. They don't dharma from their own side. You can, if you know their causes, their true causes, you can produce a perfect world. And you don't have to be stuck in these six realms of being. With that, let's say goodbye. Yeah? Huh. Sorry, it took longer than expected. Let's do this part. Dedication means whatever realization you've had, whatever depth of understanding, whatever possible thing you can put into practice, give it away to other beings on this planet who need it 
desperately. It's the only way you get to keep it. Yeah. Thursday for Bardo. Sorry, we didn't, we didn't get to it. I really thought we were going to do it.